Daniel, seal up the book to the time of the end. New Covenant Israel presents Opening the Book An Introduction to Biblical Hebrew Eschatology by Dr. Russ Houck Jacob's Trouble and the Restoration of All Israel, The Sequence of Events Our fourth session in examining Jacob's trouble is fulfilling the promises and prophecies. Once again, let us join Dr. Houck. Thank you, Brother Jeffrey. We are now going to start the fourth session, which is my favorite part of the whole thing, fulfilling the promises and the prophecies. This so screams the Hebraic root purpose. This so teaches us so many things. This particular chart has three sections as well. It has the second coming, the restoration of Israel. This is the part that so few people know anything about and the thousand year reign. Now, going back to our timeline very quickly, the wrath, it's a very short session as well, um, but the wrath takes place and now we're going into the second coming the fulfillment, and the thousand-year reign. As we said in the introduction, God's timetable is the feasts. God's timetable goes from the beginning of spring, which Yeshua fulfilled with Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. The fall feasts, which were now being fulfilled, Feast of Trumpets, was our tribulation period. There's a few days between the trumpets actually 10 days, between Trumpets and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, then we go from there, and that's the second coming, is actually the the atonement comes, and then the thousand year reign is the Feast of Weeks, the eight days, the eighth day rest. This whole thing fulfills God's patterns and his feasts. So, when you add all these pieces together, all these things, it just gets clearer and clearer and clearer who we are, what we are, what we're supposed to be doing, how we approach this whole thing called eschatology, biblical eschatology. So let's take a look at the second coming and Messiah coming to earth. Let's take a look at the first. And I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. If you're a Bible believer, then you are expecting this event to be the second coming. If you're from Judah and you're in Judaism, this will be the first coming. Either way, it's described specifically how he's coming on a white horse. He's coming with this sword that goes forth from his mouth. He's got an army that's coming with him, and he's ready to do battle to rule the nations and to bring the rest of the wrath. Hear me. The rest of the wrath. This little part right through here, folks, is not as pretty as you might think. It goes from really, really nasty, with the devil doing all he can, to the Lord saying, okay, my turn. This is the Lord's turn, and you'll see how well he does what he does. Now, let's look at Matthew, because in Matthew, the Lord gave us the hint of what that and how this was going to work, okay? Let's look at Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, 
and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Ah, immediately, that's what Yeshua said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he sends forth his servants, okay, and with a great sound of a trumpet, with a great sound of a trumpet. Now, wait a minute. The reason most people believe that the post-trib rapture theory is correct is because the seventh trumpet has been misinterpreted as the last trumpet. It's not the last trumpet. The seventh trumpet of the tribulation is not the last trumpet. Yeshua says immediately after the tribulation, well, the tribulation was seven trumpets. He sends forth his angels to gather his elect together. Now, if you have a rapture, and I believe this is the rapture, this is, in fact, he says, the dead in Christ are going to rise. Those that are alive will be changed in the moment and twinkling. All of those scriptures are referring to this sound of this particular trumpet. Now, let's take a look at what Daniel said about this event. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, Daniel said the same thing that Yeshua said two times when he was asked. First, the high priest asked him, said, we command you, we demand of you. In the name of our God, name of Yahweh, are you the one? Yeshua didn't have any choice but to say, I am the one, but you will see me coming. And, and it's like the high priest lost everything from that point from, yeah, I'm it. But Yeshua was trying to tell him when he was going to be actually coming. He says, and you will see me coming in the clouds with power and great glory. He was trying to tell him, this is not my time yet. My time's ahead. And that's exactly what he told Pilate when Pilate asked him, should you the king of the Jews? He said, no. My kingdom's not even of this time, this era. And he told him, when I come, if this were my time, my servants would rise up and fight, but this is not my time. My time's down the road, and you'll see me coming with power and great glory. And folks, he's told us how he was going to come. He told us how he was going to be here. He told us when he was going to become what the Hebrews called Hamashiach, when he becomes the world Messiah, and he will reign and rule from Jerusalem. But before he reigns and rules, I'm from Texas, and I really can't use the term that I'm thinking, he's going to... He's going to kill some folks and clean up the nations, and there's going to be a, uh, a war go forth. So that's as close as I'll get to you. But now, this is just part of this second coming thing that's happening. Let's take a look at one more scripture. Let's take a look at Corinthians and, and verify what we're talking about. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So in Corinthians, we're told again, we're, it's clarified, it's the last trumpet. I beg of you to just at least pray about your rapture theories. See if they don't actually fit in here. See if the scriptures don't tell you that this is the time and the place. And if you don't agree, that's okay. We're still brothers and sisters. Let's don't fight over that point. Let's let the Spirit teach and guide us and mold us because we're all growing and we're all growing in faith as the book is being opened. Now, another thing that's happening right now, Yeshua is coming in the clouds. He has an army with him and he has a destination. 
the rapture, the resurrection. If you're a Hebrew, it's the resurrection. If you're a Christian, it's the rapture. It actually takes place right then and there. World changed. We all go to be with him. The dead in Christ, the dead in Yeshua rise. They go with him to a specific place. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. It's Megiddo in, in Hebrew. It's Megiddo in Israel. And we're all going there with him. And it says of the kings of the earth, all these kings that have taken the mark, all these wicked, nasty kings, all of these people, and they're there with the false prophet, the beast, and the dragon. They're all there together. And they're all about to see this horrifying event take place. We're with him in the, in the sky. Now, I don't know if we, we fly like this. I don't know if we live it. I don't know how we fly, but we're going to go with him. And we're going to get to see. We're going to have a ringside seat to the biggest event in history, the Battle of Armageddon. When this happens, you better be up in there with him, not on the ground watching. Wrong place to be. So let's take a look at this event. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. So as this battle is actually happening, starting to happen, the first thing, that, this, is, this is so, uh, I find it humorous, I find it humorous because the first thing the Lord does is he grabs up the two leaders, the beast and the false prophet, and he takes them and casts, says, casts them alive in the lake of fire. And Daniel says that his body was burnt up by the fire, the beast's body is burnt up by the fire, consumed so it's an amazing that the leaders are destroyed, number one, the first moment of the battle. Now, where's that old devil? Where's that, where's that, where did the devil go? Ah, what's going to happen to that devil? He's going to be captured and be put into the lake of fire. You're going to be locked up for a thousand years, but that's coming up in just a minute. The battle then takes off and we see this unbelievable battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Men have been talking about it for decades. They've been talking about it for centuries. They've been talking about it for eons. Let's take a look at what it's going to look like. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, as the battle ends, they grab Satan and they bind him and they cast him into the bottomless pit. I guess it's the abyss. Uh, for a thousand years, that he should deceive not the nations anymore. For a thousand years, he's going to be locked up. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So let's recap. Yeshua comes. The rapture, the resurrection takes place. The, everybody heads to the battle of Megiddo, Armageddon. The beast and the false prophet are snatched up, thrown into the lake of fire. Then 
the battle takes place. This is where the horses, the blood runs to the horses bridled all the way through the valley of Megiddo. Um, then and Gog and Magog are all a part of that mess. Um, and then Satan is grabbed and locked up for a thousand years. Now, for most of our teaching, most of our life, we thought, okay, we go from that moment either to the marriage supper, if we, if, if we, if we were raised pre-trib, which I was, we were having a marriage supper while this whole mess was going on, and we come back for the thousand-year reign. There's a whole series of events that still have to happen before the thousand year reign can begin. Folks, the millennial reign, and it will begin, and I'll show you on our calendar, our timeline a little bit, where how all these pieces fit together. But the next thing that has to happen is the restoration of all Israel. All Israel has to be saved, and very unique things happen as we look at this next part of fulfilling the promises and prophecy. For in mine holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will I accept them, and there will I require your offerings, and the first fruits of your oblations, with all your holy things. I will accept you with your sweet savor, when I bring you out of the people, and gather you out of the countries wherein ye have been scattered. And I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall bring you unto the land of Israel, into the country for which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. And there ye shall remember your ways, and all your doings, wherein ye have been defiled. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O ye house of Israel, saith the Lord God. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. 
Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Behold, I send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eye. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' hands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Let's take a look at the, we've gone through these scriptures in the first step of the restoration of Israel. Do you see all these promises, and I know that's a lot of scripture, but there's enormous amounts of scripture written that we never pay attention to. Like I said, one third of your Bible deals with this event, this event that we we're going through. And we're going, oh my goodness, the Lord is in fact bringing, he's brought Judah through the fire. Judah has endured the mark of the beast, the, the, the ten horned beast, the, all, of the, all of the nightmares, Jerusalem trodden underfoot, all of these nasty singing beast things Judah has endured all that, and, and two-thirds of Judah have been wiped out. One-third of Judah was left, and God said he took Judah through the fire, purged Judah through the fire. Ephraim, he sent to the wilderness. Ephraim is out there being trained and groomed and prepared to become that bride. Judah and Ephraim, or Israel, now are coming back together. God is sending out, and he says, it's, I'm sending out fishermen. I'm sending out, <laughs> I'm sending out hunters. I'm, I'm so tickled because he says, I sowed them. I sowed them into the nations. And he said, and I know where every seed, I know where every one of you are. I know exactly where you are. I didn't forget you. I didn't abandon you. I've, I've watched you. I've watched your children. I've watched your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, all the way down through these 2,000 700 years of Israel being scattered, God has kept track of those seeds. He says, I know where every one of them are. Just like counting the hairs on my head. I don't even care about the number of hair, but God keeps a record because I'm that important to him. You're that important to him. And so he's gathering you. And whether you're adopted as a Gentile into this family through, through the gospel, however you got that, it, whether you're actually physical Ephraim or whether in spiritual Ephraim or whether you're Judah. God is now, like in Ezekiel 37, he's bringing these sticks back together in his land. He's bringing them back together. Those dry bones came forth. And folks, this is literally what is, you will get to see this happen. This part isn't taught to us. This part of the restoration of Israel. I'm going nobody's ever taught us about these things. We thought again, Yeshua comes, battle of Armageddon, thousand year reign, maybe the white throne judgment, but, but nobody's ever dealt with this, this little piece. So let's look at the second part of the restoration of Israel. Okay, judgment and execution of the nations. This is the second part, and you will probably be a part of this. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he set me unto the nations which spoiled you. 
for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones. And they shall drink and make a noise as though wine, and they shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. And they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon, and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For all the nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. And I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord of Israel unto me, Take thine wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. In my own estimate, in my own mind, I believe this is actually where Babylon, the execution actually takes place. Because all of Saudi Arabia, all of Iraq, all of Iran, all of the neighboring, all of Egypt, all of every nation around there that has been cursing and devouring Israel and Egypt, this judgment is going to be executed. You're going to be part of an army that goes forth and brings forth this judgment. Yeshua is going to lead us, and we're going to go fight and finish this fight. It's very important that you realize that this must happen. All of this judgment that's, that's throughout the scriptures, I mean, again, from the Psalms all the way to, to, to uh, Malachi, there is so many scriptures and so many battles to be fought and so many nations to be judged. This is the group and the timing when this happens. Then we move to the marriage supper. Well, that's the marriage of, of the Lamb. Okay, the marriage supper. But all this execution and judgment and these battles have to be fought. And do you know why? And do you know why? There's a rule that God put in the Torah. And he said... The, the new bridegroom cannot go to war for a year. Well, a year is a thousand years unto the Lord. And the millennial reign, the, the millennial reign, the, the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, that whole picture for us is right here. But before Yeshua can have that thousand year reign with us, these battles have to be finished and completely taken care of. So realize, let's look at the marriage supper and see what's going on there. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. 
come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamp. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye therefore to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Now, I hope we see you there at the marriage supper. I hope that we're all a part of it. And, and um, I, I've always said there's got to be two things at the marriage supper. Um, there's got to be grits and there's got to be macaroni and tomatoes. Now, you, you people that aren't from the South and not from Texas probably won't get that. But that's those are staples for us that we have to have. And that marriage supper, folks, it's going to be such a beautiful, beautiful time. From that marriage supper, we're going to actually get to see the throne set up. And there's a note on here that, that some of you may or may not see. Okay, but it, it talks about there's, there's a reward system set up. It's coming up after the thrones are set up, and, and I'll take a look at that as we look at these scriptures. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one 
went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou unto the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. He said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and that at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, now the thrones are set up. I don't know where you're going to reign and rule from. I have a particular place that um, I've had a fantasy about reigning and ruling with Brenderella, and I don't know that the Lord will allow me to do that, but I have a special request in heaven that I get to spend the millennium with Brenderella. So, and I have a special place that I want to be. Um, and it's not Jerusalem and it's not Israel, but I'll have to make the trip three times a year for the feast. Thank you.
the thousand year reign takes place. This is going to be the most exciting time. Your children will be there, your grandchildren. And people keep thinking it's like when the tribulation takes place, the whole earth is wiped out. Now, there's a large part of the earth that is wiped out, probably at least two thirds of the population. Um, there, there may be three fourths of the population. But folks, those of us who go to the wilderness, those of us whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, those of us who have been resurrected are going to all be there. And our children, if they're in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I've been praying my children and grandchildren are there, we're going to get to watch our seed be led, first of all, by God and, and directed by His Son, Yeshua. We're going, to get, we're going to stop all this arguing and bickering about religion we're going to know him. He's going to know us. We're, we're going to be this intricate family that we never have been here. So for a thousand years, your children, your grandchildren, and people are going, well, I'm scared to have kids. And I'm going, well, you know what? If God has called you to survive and make it through, if you are part of the trans-tribulational church that's going through it, take your kids with you and your grandkids with you. And on the other side, you get to reign and rule for a thousand years and your children and grandchildren will be there. So I'm for having this exciting time. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, and have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them, and seeth therein, and in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. At the end of that thousand years, and I, I've asked myself many times why the Lord did this. Um, but he has reasons, and he says that, that he actually is going gonna, is gonna to loose Satan after he's had him bound for a thousand years to, to try all the people, to tempt all the people. And, and let's take a look at the scriptures dealing with him actually loosen, loosen Satan again. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of the prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, 
and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we see that Satan is loosed. He gathers the nations again, Gog and Magog. He, brag, he brings them into what we call the, the Battle of Jerusalem. And at the Battle of Jerusalem, he is finally defeated and then casts himself into the lake of fire. So where he has been held wasn't the lake of fire. He's now cast into the lake of fire. And the next thing that happens is the great white throne judgment. Let's take a look at that. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So all men are judged. Great white throne judgment. Um, it, it is completely done. Uh, it's called the second resurrection. Everybody that died during the millennium is, is raised as well. Um, and this is a time, I, I guess, of great reward and a great sorrow. But it's the culmination of what we've all been working for. Now, God said that we would be taken off the earth at the end of this season, and he would melt it with fervent heat, and then he would create a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I assume that's here. That's an assumption. I assume that's here. I assume that heat's going to burn off everything here and start all over here on this planet. And those of us that were reigning and ruling with him will come back and repopulate. 
there, there's a lot of conjecture. There's people that write books on what it's going to be like afterwards. There's people who write book on the pre-Adamic age. It's conjecture. I don't want to go into conjecture. <laughs> What I want you to do is I want you to have these tools in your hands. I want you to be able to say to whomever, okay, um, this is what's in my Bible. This, this is what's happening. This is the, the beginning of sorrows. Uh, this is the great tribulation, okay? This is the, the wrath and the judgment of God, and this is the restoration, the fulfilling of prophecies. We want you to have these tools. We want you to have them for yourself, your children, your family. We want you to be able to use them. You can also, if you have questions, you can email us. If there's something you don't understand, we've tried to be as clear as we can in all these teachings. We want you to have the timelines so that you can watch yourself and say, here we are in this year, and here's what's happening. These events 
folks, to the very best of our ability. We've laid them out in the sequence that they come in the scriptures. And I hope and pray that this blessing, this work, this effort will help you and your family, you and your congregation, you and your friends get this inner peace, this understanding of a who your God is, how strong and powerful. And he does not lie and he does not break his promise to anyone. How in, how massive a mind he's got to plan all this. Folks, these details have taken us many, many, actually decades we've been studying this and putting this together for you to have this. And we want you to be able to go, God is so wise. He has every detail planned to the very last, last detail of your life. And if you're going to be with him, it's not going to ever end. You're going to be with him forever. So all of this is from your amazing God. Take these, use them. We're not telling you how to interpret them. We're telling you what's going to happen. Use them, bless others, teach others. Any way we can help you, we want to bless you. I want to thank Jeff Stedman. I want to thank uh, Bill McCormick. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Carol Gleason. I want to thank everybody who's helped us through this project. I am so thankful that God has sent us his very best, just like he did with his son, Yahweh always sends the very best. Blessings to you in your home. Shalom Aleichem.